And I remember this mouth was probably about two feet from me. It's one of our worst nightmares. A deep, instinctive fear. The shark cut right through my leg, right down to the bone. Driven into our psyche by the 1974 blockbuster, Jaws. A horror that's already struck in Western Australia. At the popular beaches up and down this coast, lifeguards are on edge. In just 10 months, five people have lost their lives in random attacks from the most feared oceanic predator, the villain of Jaws, the great white shark. Deaths that rock the community. Why do sharks attack humans? Can we stop them from hunting us? We really have to understand sharks to develop effective deterrence. Shark scientists around the world search for clues in the race to save people and sharks. Oh, look at that. Oh, God. Before the next attack of the real jaws. The movie Jaws was a Hollywood fantasy. A giant rogue great white shark terrorizes the beaches of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. In Western Australia, there is a fear that the fantasy has become a reality. A 300% increase in fatal attacks has made the waters of Western Australia the world's deadliest. September 2011, Kyle Burden, body water. October 2011, Bryn Martin, swimming at Perth's famous Cottesloe Beach. The hunt for a killer white pointer and George Wainwright, scuba diver. March 2012, Peter Kerman diving with his brother. July 2012, Ben Linden, surfer. And in November 2013, surfer Chris Boyd. In Perth, the attacks shocked the community and shark researchers, changing how this beach culture city thinks about swimming and surfing. Just like the town in the movie Jaws, Perth is steeped in an atmosphere of fear and public opinion is polarised. Uh, if a white shark, a great white, is seen to be in close proximity of the beach, then that shark uh, can be destroyed. State government reacts by calling for a cull of great white sharks near the beaches. Others want the federally protected animals left alone. But it's not just great whites that are a threat. Other species known to attack humans are bull sharks, hammerheads, bronze whalers, and tiger sharks. You don't feel the teeth. You don't feel anything. A bit of pressure, like surgeon steel. David Pickering was a snorkeling tour guide on the reefs of Australia's west coast. There was three kids with me at the time. I said, guys, I've got a bad feeling, stick together. And I spun around and I remember this mouth was probably about two feet from me. The tail sort of kicked out once and it was on me. Put a hand out like that and actually cut 13 tendons and all three nerves. After you've been bitten, the first thing on your mind is, is it coming back for me? or someone else. Thank God I got bitten and not one of the kids because I couldn't live with that. I can't go out in the water now without thinking about it. Can't shake that feeling. Yeah. Nervous. Anxious. <sighs> this is what it reduces me to. And when you love something so much, then you can't do it. I used to take things for granted. Why? Having a limb that works perfectly. But now I appreciate every day. What triggers sharks to attack humans when we are not their natural prey? 
And can scientists find a way to prevent these tragic events? The job of finding out how sharks sense us, what triggers an attack, and how to prevent it, falls to Dr. Sean Collins, senior researcher at the University of Western Australia. One of the basic questions we're really interested in is determining why a shark attacks prey versus a human. What are the sensory cues it uses to make that decision? Turns on his axis. He's short and he's gone. And he's gone. Collins' work delves deep into shark biology to learn, for the first time, what sharks see, hear, smell and sense in ways we're just beginning to understand. His goal? Test all the shark deterrents currently on the market and develop new ones based on groundbreaking science. We want to get rid of the guesswork. Uh, we want to base it on evidence that we can then rigorously test and have statistical basis to rely on to develop these deterrents and bring them to market. He's come here on the coast of Western Australia to a place with a well-earned name, Shark Bay. To test shark deterrents based on years of research into the sensory systems of sharks. Sharks are a major part of the marine ecosystem. They've been around for a over 400 million years, they balance the ecosystem. They're sensory machines which are, are sampling the environment continuously. Sharks have sensors like us. Sight, smell, taste, hearing and touch. But they have other extraordinary sensors beyond our own. They can detect weak electrical fields, the Earth's magnetic field, and minute changes in water pressure caused by passing prey. Collins' research focuses on shark vision, especially in the creature that haunts our Jaws-inspired nightmares, the great white shark. Crack this sensory code, and Collins may just hold the key to saving lives. Great white sharks are ambush predators cruising deeper water to spot prey above them. Colin pioneered the technique of determining what sharks can see and how well. They see a silhouette of a human, but that casting of that silhouette, high contrast edges, look a lot like a seal, especially if it's on a surfboard or a swimmer at the surface. So if we can work out how a great white visualises its prey from below, we've got a very good chance of preventing an attack. Colin's work with shark vision starts here, in the lab. For the first time, deconstructing how the great white targets its prey. We've got a, a great white eye mm -hmm. from an individual about two and a half metres long. The structure of shark eyes is similar to our own. With surgical precision, Colin and team member Caroline Kerr remove the retina from the shark's eye. A thin, transparent layer of tissue containing light-sensitive cells called photoreceptors and other cells that transmit information to the brain. A bit like peeling an orange. The more tightly the photoreceptors are packed within the retina, the sharper the image. Look at that. That's the retina. <laughs> <laughs> then, the transparent retina is stained with a purple dye, making the cellular structures easily visible with a computer-controlled microscope. The result is a map of the shark's retina, showing the density of photoreceptors in different areas. In this case, the highest densities of cells occur in this region of the retina. This part of the eye has the greatest ability to see detail, contrast and movement. That means that in the Great White's field of view, their sharpest vision is of objects above them, putting surfers and swimmers directly in the line of sight 
of these awesome predators. This gives us a lot of information about what part of the eye they direct towards eating prey. So the need for effective shark deterrence is greater than ever. And not just in Australia. Back in the real life setting of the movie Jaws, something is causing great whites to gather in frightening numbers that have never been seen before. Off the coast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, where the movie Jaws was filmed, great white sharks are appearing in waters where for hundreds of years they've almost never been seen. For fisheries biologist Greg Skomol, it's a new opportunity to study animals in the western North Atlantic, whose behaviour is virtually unknown. And if he can track and monitor their movements, he may be able to lessen the risk to swimmers. The white shark is probably the most charismatic fish in the ocean. The white sharks can weigh in excess of four or 5,000 pounds, get in excess of 20 feet long. So that's a very big fish. We know that these sharks can live up to 50 years. Great whites are found in every ocean. Unlike most other sharks, they produce and store heat in their bodies, allowing them to tolerate colder temperatures. In an area where they were rarely seen, Scomel was surprised to sight and tag one great white shark in 2008 off Cape Cod. Over the next three years, he tagged 17 great whites. Then in 2012 alone, he tagged 17 more. If you said to me five years ago, you're going to tag 34 white sharks in the next four years, I'm going to say you're out of your mind. Why has Cape Cod suddenly become the summer hunting grounds for one of the ocean's most dangerous predators? For Skomal, the answer is obvious. On the beaches and in the water. Seals. It wasn't until we had the development of these seal aggregations here in the eastern side of Cape Cod that the white sharks started to take notice. The growing number of great whites in the area seems tied to a population explosion among seals. We have several species of seals that occur here, but the two dominant ones are harbor seals and gray seals. The gray seal is a much bigger seal species. It's the one I believe that the white sharks are targeting. Gray seals get to be about seven, eight hundred pounds and eight, nine feet long. They're big animals, they're big targets, big thick blubber layer on them. And now we know that there's over 300,000 seals off Canada alone and tens of thousands off the coast of the United States. It's really ideal habitat for them. But in them coming here, in essence, they've, uh, they've opened the cafe for white sharks. You've got the perfect zone for white sharks to come in and consume these animals on a routine basis. And that's precisely what we've been seeing over the last decade, as the cafe emits some kind of delicious odor, I'm sure, that goes out miles into the Great South Channel. And once the sharks come in and figure it out, We've actually had animals come back each year. For the seals or anyone swimming near them, these have become dangerous waters. In the last several years, we've been seeing more and more evidence of these seals being attacked. Bites on seals, dead seals, wounds that can really only be created by one species of fish, you know, the white shark. Sometimes. He only finds what's left. These are the uh, intestines of a seal, and that would be really good evidence of an attack. That's all that's left, which is pretty amazing. It is ironic that 10 miles or so from here is, uh, you know, the, the set of the movie Jaws. 
We talk about Jaws as this Hollywood production that was fantasy. And if we look at all the elements of Jaws, we see really many parts of it that are somewhat true. What Spielberg did was just take those tidbits of truth and exaggerate the hell out of them. The white shark getting 20 feet long becomes the white shark 25 feet long. The white shark nibbling the boat it becomes the white shark sinking the boat. The white shark biting people to the white shark becoming a, a ravenous predator desiring human flesh. All it takes is just, you know, one person to be killed in this area, and that fiction can become reality. When we have this kind of geographic overlap between high densities of white sharks and high densities of people, inevitably we get interactions. Was Cape Cod likely to be the next place that happens? Yeah, sure. This is Shark Cove. This, this is, is Shark Cove. Is this is the one we get most of the detections on, right? Skomal detects the presence of the sharks he's tagged over the past four years with a series of acoustic receivers suspended in the water. This is the big one. All right. The uh, so number four. E4. The tags transmit a signal indicating that Skomal's sharks are returning to their summer hunting grounds. You tell me when you're ready. Ready. We've had a shark here today within the past half hour. This kicks his tagging effort into high gear. He uses a specially outfitted boat to sneak up on and tag more sharks. If Skomal finds sharks close to the beaches, he can warn beach officials. You've got one 20 meters away just sitting in the water. You may not know it's there. Despite the Great White's massive size, a spotter plane is the best way to find untagged sharks in the murky green water off the Cape. Here we go, right up in the shallows, heading for the shore. See the shadow ahead of you? There, he's coming back. Right under us, right under us. That's our baby. Skomal estimates nice this shark. Great White is nearly four meters long, and it's swimming just 100 meters from the beach. There, he's coming back. In water almost shallow enough for a swimmer to stand. Look at it, really moving. In just one day, Skomal spots five great whites. Some he's tagged in previous years. I see one of the tags, it's red. And newcomers too. Animals that have been elusive can now be studied. It's a nice fish. As Skomal successfully tags more and more sharks. It looks really good. Yep, let's tag, let's tag him. him. We got it. We got it. It's pioneering stuff. It's never been done before. We never had predictable access to white sharks in the western North Atlantic. And because of all those seals sitting out there, now we do. His acoustic tags may save lives, allowing officials to close beaches when a tagged shark is detected. We can tell where the sharks are and when they approach popular swimming beaches. And in some cases, we've actually reached out to those areas to say, oh, by the way, you've got a shark in your backyard. Halfway across the world in Western Australia, could seals be the reason behind the spike in fatal attacks? There's not a day that I haven't thought about it. Elise Franken was a snorkeling guide for tourists wanting to swim with dolphins. I was diving under the water and came up for a breath and that's when I just, just felt this almighty whack. The impact was just like getting slammed by a train. I remember getting pushed out of the water. I looked down and that's when I knew what, what had happened. First reaction was punch it, push it away. The shark swam off and I started sinking. Um, I was unconscious. I remember taking my first breath. As soon as they got me on the boat, that's when the pain kicked in. Very, very intense pain. 
the shaft cut right through my leg, um, right down to the bone. About 70 stitches on that side and 130 or something on that side. I had a shark tooth pulled out of my bone. I had to learn how to walk again. My mind is starting to play games on me now. I'm starting to dream about sharks a lot more. The longer I stay out of the ocean, the more scared I get. The spate of attacks in Western Australia has left people frightened and scientists puzzled. Why do these attacks happen? Could they be tied to an increase in a key food source for great whites? Seals? On Rottnest Island in Western Australia, a fledgling colony of seals has taken hold just 13 kilometres from the popular beaches of Perth, where surfing, swimming and scuba diving is a way of life. And fatal shark attacks are on the rise. Are the sharks hunting seals and finding people instead? Fisheries Department scientist Rory McCauley wants to find out. Sharks can be anywhere. Uh, that's what we're trying to find out, is when, where and why sharks come in close to, to Perth beaches or Rottnest Island. McCauley monitors the movements of tagged great white sharks with these acoustic receivers. Data is transmitted directly to his computer. The sharks, he says, aren't here for the seals. They do eat seals, but it seems very unlikely to me that this handful of seals is providing enough of a draw card to either be attracting sharks and or keeping them here for any sustained period of time. Why more sharks are here, Macaulay says, isn't clear. What is clear is that with more people than ever enjoying the ocean, the risk of sharks and people meeting head on has gone up. And not just in Western Australia. It's the peak of summer, a young woman decides to go for a swim off a Queensland beach at a place called Amity Point. Bizarrely echoing the name of the town terrorised by a shark in the movie, Jaws. Just 15 metres from the beach, she dies alone in the water. Rare as they are, shark bites are horrific events. Preventing shark attacks is Sean Collins' goal. He's here in Shark Bay, Western Australia, to test shark deterrents that are already available to the public and new ones that he and his team are developing. We worked on lots of smaller sharks in our laboratory tanks at the university, but we've got to make that progression from the lab to the wild. These metal frames are designed to hold a bait canister to attract sharks, along with a shark deterrent to be tested and a pair of cameras. The idea of having two cameras is that we've got two different perspectives on the behaviour of the sharks. Colin's team preps the first test with a device that emits an electric field, powerful enough to shock a human if the antenna is touched. This type of deterrent has a, a long electrode, which is this lead here, which extends for a couple of metres, uh, typically behind a diver or the wearer. And once turned on, creates quite an extensive and fairly strong electric field around the device. This is the other type of commercially available electric device that we're going to be testing. It's an anklet style device, again worn by divers or swimmers. Bait canisters are filled with a mixture of smelly, bloody ground fish. and the electro-repellent rigs are deployed. But will they work? Each rig is anchored to the bottom and suspended in the water column by floats. They'll be left for two to three hours, enough time, they hope, for the bait to attract a shark. 
This is what happens when these rigs are deployed without deterrent. Bites that would inflict serious wounds. Which will be stronger? The scent of food or the electric deterrents? Can Colin's team learn how sharks use other senses to target their prey? And find a way to keep us safe? Great white sharks rely on vision to target their prey. But other species rely more on their ability to sense electrical fields or their sense of smell. How can we tell which senses are of the greatest importance for each species? Kari Yopak, a member of Colin's research team, gets inside the shark's head, literally to find out. Kari Opek studies the brains of sharks to understand what senses they rely on most. When you look at a brain, I can make fairly good predictions about what that animal's eating, how fast it's swimming, the general environment that it's living in. This is the brain of a great hammerhead shark. Hammerheads are open ocean predators living along the continental shelf in tropical and warm temperate seas worldwide. They feed mostly on fish. Its regions for the brain for vision are actually not very enlarged. This is likely not to be a very visual animal. Hammerheads rely on other senses like electroreception to target their prey, allowing them to detect the electrical charge given off by a muscle twitch or a heartbeat of the potential prey a sense much more developed than in the great white. Here we've got the brains of the great white. The regions of the brain that receive visual input are quite large in comparison to other species, as are the regions of the brain that receive smell. But what becomes very pronounced in the hammerhead is this protrusion here at the front of the brain. And this is a region that we've associated with what we call social intelligence. So you see enlargement of this area in species that form true schools, that aggregate by sex and size, and that often have complex courtship and mating rituals. Whereas um, in the great white, that region of the brain is not very pronounced, um, which leads us to believe that the great white is in fact a solitary hunter. There's another conspicuous difference between the brains of these two species. A lot of people are really surprised when they see the brain of a great white, particularly in comparison to the hammerhead, because it looks so small. There's an amazing range of um, behaviors that the great white is capable of, and it's all controlled by this brain. So there's clearly a difference in senses that these animals are relying on. They all have the same battery of sensory systems, but the relative importance of each of those systems is gonna be varied between species. The degree to which different species rely on individual senses is reflected by what parts of the brain are enlarged. Clues to which senses to target to develop effective deterrence. The idea of creating a blanket repellent that's gonna repel all sharks in the same way really isn't realistic. But when we're developing a repellent for a great white shark, we likely want to target the visual sense. If sharks' eyes resemble our own, can they see different colors, like us? Colin thought that sharks, like their close relatives, stingrays, would have color vision similar to ours. Whether you're a fish or a human, colour vision is made possible by three different types of cells in the retina, called cone cells, each one responding to a different colour, red, green or blue. Working in Sean Collins' lab, colleague Nathan Hart uses a machine that measures what colour light the shark's photoreceptive cells are sensitive to. So you can see here the beam as it scans through from the UV to the red. What he finds in the shark species that they've examined, including great whites, is that they only detect one colour of light in the green part of the spectrum. Everything they see is in shades of that colour. For us, with no other colour to compare, it's like black and white. We were very surprised to find out that sharks were colour blind. Two out of the three cone photoreceptors were missing. 
So we only found a single cone photoreceptor. Now this means that they don't have the machinery within the retina to process colour. Colin believes this inability to see colour and a reliance on high contrast are keys to creating an effective deterrent for many species of shark. Sight, smell, electroreception. Different sensors relied on by different species. But is there a way to keep all sharks from attacking us? Scientists Sean Collin and his team are experimenting with new technologies to deter shark attacks. On Shark Bay, they're testing deterrents based on their research into shark vision. This one is a flashing light. They'll transfer the footage to their computers to watch later. Dave, here's the cameras from Rig 27. This is the strobe lights. Oh, brilliant. Let's see if we've uh, had some luck this time. In the meantime, they've got another deterrent to test. Scientifically designed patterns for wetsuits. This is um, designed to be camouflaged underwater, certainly to the visual system of a shark. Yep. As Colin and Hart discovered, sharks are colorblind. They see the world in shades of black and white. This material is designed to fade into the background as the light changes at different depths, each colour tailored to what a shark's eye sees. Right, so the idea is the shark just swims by and has trouble seeing it. That's right. A second design is very different. We've also got something which has been suggested for a number of years to be a good shark deterrent, and that's a pattern that mimics a sea snake's coloration. Sea snakes are highly venomous, and like many animals that are, they advertise their toxicity with bold patterns that warn predators to stay away. Most sharks don't like eating things that are striped, such as a sea snake. It actually is a noxious animal to them. Avoiding stripes seems to be a strategy of many sharks. Again, the team's research into what sharks can see is crucial to recreating the sea snake design in the right proportions. We had to actually work out the spacing of that pattern, the bars or the stripes, by our knowledge of the spatial resolving power or the resolution of the eye. The underwater cameras run continuously during each test of a deterrent. For the scientists, finding that instant when a shark approaches means scanning hours of footage. Finally, their patience is rewarded. <laughs> oh, that's cool. A bronze whaler, a shark known to attack humans, has found the bait. This test rig has the flashing light as a visual deterrent. That's nice, isn't it? It's got a little remora following you on the yeah. dorsal uh, flank. The shark makes five passes at the bait, never getting too close, each time turning away. These sharks are opportunistic things, clearly interested in the bait. But the flashing light seems to keep this one at a distance. Certainly being deterred. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can probably analyse this in slow motion as well, so you can time when the light's on with how the shark reacts. Absolutely. So. Next up, results from the test rig we saw earlier with the bait canisters and the anklet-style electrical deterrent. Oh, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. Oh, God. The hammerhead. Wow. <laughs> Hammerheads hunt with electro reception, and they seem especially sensitive to electrical fields. God, he came straight in. Right towards the bait, and then almost did a 180 degree turn straight away. 
Yeah, it looks like he used a turtle. Right? And this this is the um, when the device was turned on with the electric yeah. field yeah. extending yeah. out. Yeah. Come on, that was amazing. Finally, the bold sea snake wetsuit design seems to turn another hammerhead on its tail. <laughs> Reacted almost instantaneously. What we'll be able to do with right. that, yeah. so we'll be able to measure. Did the same behaviour, but didn't get as close this time. It was deterred from a, a greater distance from the uh, actual device. This first step in their research seems to be paying off. Colin and his team will take what they've learned here to create the next evolution of the Terran devices and test them in a way that's never been done before. Sean Colin has spent years researching the sensory system of sharks to understand why they attack humans and to find ways to stop them. And now, he'll examine the latest devices his lab has created from a perspective no other scientist has had. Inside a submarine. Here we go. I'm just venting my BCD now. Status lights are good. Permission to dive. <laughs> That's beautiful. What an amazing view. For the first time, Colin will observe how his deterrents work in the open ocean and how they might appear to sharks. But I must say, this is a really unique perspective to watch the deterrents in action. Uh, it's not only my first time in this submersible, but also to actually see how well um, the rigs are actually um, playing out in, in the natural environment. This perspective is, is quite incredible. After their efforts in Shark Bay, the team has built a new, more powerful flashing light deterrent. See the rig very clearly. Look at that. Oh, it's sitting up beautifully. Oh, it's really clear. Isn't it? You can see the uh, floats yeah, vertically the, suspending yeah. the horizontal bar. With the two yeah. stereo cameras facing downwards yeah. and having a very good view of both the bottom and the, yeah. and the flashing light deterrent, which is. Uh, Extremely bright. <laughs> yeah. The team redesigned the test rig to look down on the bait and deterrent and modify the strength and speed of the flash. I've done quite a lot of work to determine how fast the retina can react to, to light. The brilliant flashing light should frighten a shark, like our reaction when suddenly caught in the headlights of an oncoming car. Colin thinks this could be a personal deterrent if the large battery pack now floating at the surface can be made smaller. A diver could uh, strap this to his tank or, uh, or his ankle or something and um, it would be a, an effective deterrent. There's a startle factor and we think this is also a very useful way to deter sharks. From the patches of material they tested in Shark Bay, Colin has helped design wetsuits for divers and surfers. But this is the first time Colin will see how each suit performs from the shark's perspective. It's been wonderful to see these, these divers in, in mid-water and how well the striped suit is actually seen at quite some distance and how under certain conditions, depending on which way we're looking, how the camouflage suit actually tends to merge a little bit into the background. The effectiveness of the design becomes more apparent when viewed the way a shark sees, basically in black and white. These suits are on the market. Colin and Hart's research may already be paying off for divers and surfers, but more tests with big predatory sharks are needed. We are still involved um, in doing further testing on more species and under different conditions. A major focus of Colin's research is devising a deterrent that can protect not just an individual, but an entire beach. This is going to be the first time we've tested this in the wild, so this is very exciting. <laughs> a device that's effective on many types of sharks. Oh, 
there we go. Look at that. So oh. bubbles come out. God, look at that. It's a continuous stream of bubbles over 10 metres. It's a bubble curtain. A wall of fine bubbles that will seem like a physical barrier to a shark. And that's quite powerful bubble extending most of the way to the surface. Colin believes that this veil of bubbles affects sharks in more than one way. So the shark approaches, it will actually provide a visual barrier to them, so they may be very reticent to, to cross that. The bubbles will make a noise, and so there may be also an auditory deterrent there as well. And of course, the, all sharks have a well-developed lateral line sense. The lateral line in sharks and fishes is highly sensitive to touch and changes in water pressure, a sense that will be overstimulated by the bubble curtain. That would actually interfere with their lateral line system and then provide a, a third sensory deterrent. So we'd have a visual, acoustic and a lateral line sense all being interfered with simultaneously. <laughs> Look at that. That really is a wall of bubbles, a very impressive non-physical barrier that sharks will, I think, see as a, as a wall. As far as a test is concerned, I think this is a great success. Colin envisions this bubble curtain one day protecting entire swimming beaches. With a large compressor um, mounted on shore, one could actually switch that on and um, provide uh, an effective non-physical barrier uh, that people could feel more protected with him. For Colin, this submersible has let him see his deterrence in an entirely new way. This is an, an amazing way of assessing the effectiveness of, of these deterrents and really has made a big difference to our research. With what they've learned here today, Colin and his team will test this next evolution of deterrents with the animals that count bulls, tigers, and great white sharks. Despite the spate of attacks that have happened over the last year or so, it's still inherently hard to find large predatory sharks off our coastlines. For now, there is no one answer, no surefire way to protect humans from attack. But these latest designs may reduce the number of attacks. We need more sharks interacting with our deterrents before we can really make any judgments about how effective they are. They're wild animals, they're hard to study, but we really do feel that we can deter them from our beaches. That's the goal that these scientists are racing to achieve, in their quest to better understand these powerful predators and to try and save the lives of both humans and sharks.